Her uterus is around 12 to 14 weeks. Her belly's big enough that I think I can get away with hiding the camera within the belly button. But, you know, I try to hide this incision if possible. So normally I try to go finger, uh, four finger breaths above the fundus. You know, in her particular case, we've got four fingers, so we should be fine. The uterus is 20 weeks. Obviously, we go up high. Um, the highest I've had to go is right below the xiphoid process. And then the only other issue is to put the ports higher so that you can get up and around the uterus if need be. The instrumentation with the robot is they're definitely long enough that they can get down to the pelvis. So it's better to err on the side of higher ports than lower where you get handcuffed with the fibroids. On this particular lady, she's uh, you know, 200 and some pounds. The 8.5 millimeter scope should still work. Can I have that port? The only limiting factor is the length here because the port has to actually be docked here. It can't be docked up here like the other ones. You just have to be careful that you have enough length to get that in. So, yeah, I try to stick with just the traditional robotic ports that we have. All right, we'll take Trendelenburg, please. And then with these ports, again, you want to just try to get them lateral to the umbilicus and the table can you put the table all the way down please so as you can see most of her fibroid is posterior and uh, actually it's a lot posterior <laughs> is that the maximum t -Berg? Nancy is that the okay so roughly again 10 centimeters lateral and usually about a six to seven millimeter incision to keep the port a little tighter. And then you just want to watch these ports going in. Just don't hit the bow. Okay, okay. So Dr. Bukowski's making that look easy. Uh, dude, why is our gas so high? I mean, our pressure. Okay. It's a great answer. So again, the same deal over here. Again, I usually put these ports in after she's insufflated. I don't bother marking beforehand. I don't measure. I just do it by where the abdomen allows me to do it. Can you follow me, brother? Okay. So as you can see, she has a little bit of adhesive disease here, which we will simply manage. You, you want to start with the around ligament. As you can see, her broad ligament is full of fibroid. So we want to try to free this up as much as we can to try to get into our proper planes. Okay. That's a nice fibroid there, huh? And again, in this particular case, we want to try to leave this uh, ovary in place. So a lot of times when you first start these larger uteri, um, it looks like you're not going to have enough space or room. so. Usually if you just take little bits at a time and work with it to try to free it up, it eventually goes your way.
So again, you want to try to connect to where you made your incision in the round ligament as best you can. It's going to be a little more difficult because she has such a large uh, fibroid over here. Dr. Mershon, what size uterus would you do the bivalve technique for? Uh, well, I, you know, I've had nulliparous females that, you know, just with a moderate, like eight week size uterus, I've had a bivalve. Um, but usually, you know, anything 12 to 14 weeks, you get an estimate of the size of the vagina and, uh, you know, anything to make the specimen come out easier. So sometimes it's not necessarily the size of the uterus per se, but the size of what you're working with from below. I'm just going to try to free this off of the sidewall here. That's really... Okay, so usually, you know, again, you just sort of take what you can get when you can get it. Um, a lot of times you're unable to manipulate the uterus very well initially because of the size of the fibroids. So as you free it up more, a lot of times you're able to get a little better manipulation. Okay. So now you can see we can get around this corner. The nice thing is that with the robot arms, they're just super strong. You can see her blood vessel right here. So at this particular juncture, I'm going to just try to get this bladder down a little bit better, just in case I happen to go too deep with my dissection. You just want to try to get the bladder down as best you can. You know, they do make a the scope that you can see around corners. I think a majority of the time you can do it with a straight scope, but if you need to, you can swap out scopes. Okay, let's uh, come back over here, my friend. Great. So as you can see, we got a little more mobility here. And again, because you can see so much better, you can see all this loose surrealer tissue. that dissection done. Okay, then we're going to come back up here. Again, this is our vessels right here, so we're going to try to skeletonize this a wee bit. That's okay. You're doing fine. So this is the the cup right there that I'm hitting, right, Mike? You feel me touching you there? Okay. So again, what I'm going to do is just to decompress this a little bit, I'm uh, just going to get this really high up for now. This is nowhere where I'm normally going to take it, but I just want to get the blood out of it for a couple minutes while we're working on the other side. Okay.
So you can try to get as much of that loose areola tissue. So I'm going to go over to the other side because sometimes you got to loosen that up a bit to get things rolling. see these really cauterized very nicely so we're going to work on this side a little bit and you can see the very large posterior myoma sort of hug the uterus as tight as possible. Can that picture looks a little yeah if he can. So anyway, you want to try to get into the broad ligament again, if you can. Looks a little thick here. Again, I like to try to get these uh, separated, these leaves of the broad ligament and take care of any back bleeding or anything that you come up to. You can see she just got a lot of filmy adhesions. Dr. Mashan, what are some of the things to watch out for when you're dealing with a large uterus? Well, I think, you know, you just, you got to be very mindful of the bladder. You know, the bladder is usually a little higher up or a little different location. You definitely want to do, you know, sometimes it tries to force you into doing your hysterectomy different than you normally would want to. So you want to try to stay in your normal uh, orientation that you would normally do. So again, you can see here's the big vessels here. Um, Mike, I think you're here. So, yep. So we're gonna. So you just want to, you know, again, be very cautious with the bladder because the bladder is a little stretched and in, and a lot more high than you're normally thinking of. And then again, you just try to do it the same way you do your regular technique. Nothing different and take as little bits as you can until you get to the, the planes and the spaces that you want. So again, you know, we're working the bladder down. We want to see the nice white like we have there. You just have to be a little more careful with the handling of the tissue because again, the vessels, everything's a little bigger. You want to be a little more mindful of making good clean pedicles. Again, because the tissue is a little bit uh, more full and again especially if you're using just a two-arm technique you don't have the luxury of suction irrigation so you just have to be a little more preemptive like you see this vein here you, know, you got to be careful you don't want to get into that if you can avoid it you're fine Mike but again like uh, because the v-care is in place you know he's able to do the traditional 
part that uh, an assess report would do. So I'm just going to go a little higher here to try to get that vein down without getting into it. So again, here's the good weight that we're looking for, as always. A lot of varicosity. So I'm going to come over to this side, Mike. So again, it's just more important to try to skeletonize a little better so your pedicles aren't as thick and that uh, you can get your cauterization to be more effective. So this is the artery. We'll, we'll cauterize these separately. This is the vein back here. Like, can you get that? Uh, actually, stay right there for just one second. You just got to be careful when you go lateral. You don't want to get into the blood vessels out here. So yeah, so the whole point, you know, the whole point is you're trying to sort of avoid trouble, as opposed to dealing with it when it happens. You know, inevitably you're going to get little bleeders here and there, but if you can see them preemptively, then you can get away with uh, using less ports. So again, I'm just trying to get this cleaned off a little bit better. You know, I know we're good right here, so normally I would take my uterine right about here. See, so once you, once you get to the white of the cervical fascia, then you know the bladder's down, you know the, the ureter, ureters are out of the way. Um, I sort of bisect these or dissect these in, in layers because it's just such a big pedicle. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you can, yeah, just like that for one second, Mike. Just want to try to free up this posterior because I think that's all going to be a, at your cup there, I think. All right. So again, the key is you want to make sure when you transect the uterines. You want to get the uterines way lateral before you start doing any dissection for the colpotomy. So again, you try to leave a clean space and then you cut this pedicle and you can see those vessels are pretty big, I would have to say. And then again, once you get down to the cervical fascia, you make your incision sort of curved. And you can always re-grab for safety. Um, I'm just not, I'm not happy posterior yet. I just don't think we have the whole thing posteriorly here. Try to take this in that lumen pretty well, huh? Nice. Okay. So let me see if I can come over. Can you push in so I scoop it more posteriorly, Mike? That's great. Oh, that's beautiful. Just like that for a second, my friend. So again, um, you know, I don't like to do the whole colpotomy, but I like to at least incise a little bit posterior so that because once you bivalve the specimen, sometimes it's hard to get posterior. But again, the key is you want to use the V-care for the counter traction. So this is my cup right there. So I know I'm good there. I'm through this uterine. So we're just about ready to uh, bivalve this thing. Again, the, the 
pedicles are lateral. They're below my cup, so my cup is right through here. So I'm just going to try to go up on this. Oh, maybe not. Okay. That's okay. You know what? Let's come around this uterine a little bit better. I, I didn't. I didn't get this uterine fully. Again, because of the position of these fibroids, it's not that this uterus is overtly humongous. It's just where everything is is kind of difficult. So, again, the nice thing is we we got our our space clear here. So now it's just a matter of getting this pedicle, this uterine down, on this side. And again, this is a little more diffuse looking. You're fine, Mike, just like that. So as much of this skeletonization as you can do, the best before you make your incisions and colpotomies and things. Dr. Mershon, do you do your bivalve after the copotomy? No, I actually do it before. So what I'll do is um, I'll free everything up and then bivalve it and then complete the copotomy. Um, yes, correct. So anyway, so this is what I'm going to call the uterine pedicle here on this side. And again, you can see the white posteriorly, you see the white anteriorly, so you know the ureter is not in there. Um, yeah, so if you, you know, obviously you won't lose gas if you don't make the full colpotomy. And like I said, it's best to have that V-care available for traction, counter-traction if you can. So again, this is just getting the anterior portion of the pedicle. There's still veins back here that I'm not getting yet, but I'll try. As you can see, as you, as you free it up more and more, he's able to give you better and better traction and manipulation. So, you know, you might not see the cup initially, so, but as you continue your dissection, he can get you to a point where you can see it. So again, this isn't the whole vessel, but I'm gonna take this now while I can. with the caveat that I know that posteriorly here we've still got some issues. I just can't get can't get a whole bite. There you go. So again, if you can control these pedicles before you lose them, um, it does help you in terms of blood loss. So I'm going to try to clean this up a little bit. Obviously the bow you can see is under there. So we'll go up this way. But this has totally freed up that myoma from the sidewall that was there a minute ago. And then I just got to get this cut anteriorly here a little bit better. And again, you can see this is where our copotomy is going to be. I just want this uterine a little freer. Okay, so now we'll, we'll again cut the uterine and we'll start skeletonizing around posteriorly at least. And again, just sort of freeing up and cauterizing anything that looks like it'll be back bleeding or problematic. Okay, and then I'm just, yeah, just like that, Mike, stay right where you are. That's perfect. So I'm just going to skeletonize this a little bit just to make sure this bladder is all the way down. 
So that is about it. So, uh, Jeff, I need the pedal switched. So again, so once you have the blood supply, um, you know, before before you do though, let me just let me just get this to. Here's a bladder pillar here. I still need you to push in, Mike. Yeah. That's great, just like that. I just want to get these little sinuses off of the vagina. You know, so again, here's the cup here, all the way here. And I just want to try to get more posterior if I can. That's great, just like that. So again, we freed up the uterus sacral on this side. Again, cup is right there. Just going to fix this sinus. So you can see the uterus, essentially the blood supply is gone. So I just want to see how far we can get on this way. And I just think if I can free up this uterus sacral, we'll have a little more manipulation. So you can see that's what's still holding it up. This is the dissection we did on this side. So we're going to score this around a little bit. And you can see that pop. And then the cup should be right there. Okay, so now we know we're in posterior. That's all we really need. And then we're going to bivalve this. Yes, please. So there's two ways we can do this. Um, because this looks like two uteri, we could go this way and uh, see if we can bring that out lengthwise. It's sort of a heart-shaped uterus. Or we can go straight down the middle here, which. Uh, yes, please. 60 pure cut. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go straight up this way for the bivalve. Okay, so Mike, you're going to, what Mike's going to do with the V care is he's going to deflect everything off to the right side or to the one arm, and then I'm going to use counter traction to pull everything back to the two arm. And what you can do is you just try to stay essentially lined up and you're using 60 pure cut and you can either use one blade or two blades but whatever gets it going so this is the cut mode and you just want to get it started okay you can suck out that gas brother that's fine I'm just gonna wait it's just going to take a little longer this time because we're just tell me when it's clear enough that you can see enough to I can see great okay so anyway you just try to stay straight in the plane and regretfully there will be some smoke but okay we'll stop there until you get some more smoke out Uh, no, I don't. Um, you know, most fibroids are benign. You know, obviously if she has a history or she's older or if there's a concern, then, you know, you want to do an open case, I guess. But uh, majority of the time, the, the fibroids are benign, so we're using that on our side. It's much better than morselating. You know, the nice thing with the bivalve technique is we're not morselating the ovaries. We're not uh, morselating the cervix. So essentially, we're just simply uh, bivalving the uterus, and uh, like I said, for you know, you, it's probably worthwhile to make sure the endometrium's benign so that you're not doing anything. But yeah, as far as fibroids, I, I'm not concerned about. 
bivalve and with fibroids. So again, you sort of just try to stay in the same plane. You can see it really cuts very well. And this is actually a fibroid right here that we're going to just cut through. And then you can use, that's a degenerating fibroid. You can use these as, as traction and just pull on it while you're waiting for the smoke to clear. You know, anything you can do to try to get as much uh, dissected as possible. You can use these as just regular scissors if you get a, a persistently tough part. But the key is really the traction that he's putting on it because without that traction, it does not not going to cut. So if you have to, if you can't get enough traction on it, you know, you have to put in an assistant port or something, then you should do that. And then again, you're just trying to stay in alignment to make this smaller. So you can see that we're going to go actually here. Dr. Mershon, for the uh, surgeons who are just starting out with the bivalve technique, what are some things that they should watch out for? Well, again, I think it's it's crucial to keep everything within view. Make sure that you're you know you're not inadvertently getting the bowel behind you or anything. Um, try to you know take your time. You don't have to be as aggressive initially, especially as you're getting closer or more posterior down here towards the bowel. But you'll find as you as you work it, it'll start sort of gravity will just sort of let it flop apart, and it actually, if you just keep working sort of similar planes, you don't stay in one particular area. You just keep working the planes as you go, and again with the V care, if he's able to, you know, manipulate and elevate, that really helps you in terms of safety. So again, you know, I try to score where I'm going and do a little bit at a time. Okay, so we'll let that smoke clear. So you can see this is actually the cavity here. It's nice when you see that because that you know you're at least halfway through. You can also use the back end of these instruments as traction. So for instance, you can weigh the, weigh the, uh, the uterus down with the back end of the scissors and use the tips uh, sometimes you have to change orientation and just say, all right, well, I'm going to go anterior to posterior as a part of, as opposed to vertical, or you can switch to horizontal, whatever gets the job done. And again, this is the, you can see the V care in there. Can you push that in a little more? So you, you know, you know you're safe because you're inside the cavity here. And if you can work your way out from the cavity, that helps you stay oriented also. So again, as long as you just take your time, take what it gives you. If you have to, you can drive around fibroids. You know, you don't necessarily have to cut through every one. You know, you can go in between these two here. Is the screen blurry for you guys, or it's okay? So essentially, you're just debulking it enough that you can get it out in a long strip vaginally. Most times the, uh, you know, the hysterectomy takes a little bit, but the bivalving, depending on the size and how many pieces you make, can take up to 15 minutes or so. But I think it's still less time than the morselator. And again, cost-wise, you're not putting an accessory port in. I'm still using the same two ports that I've been given. I'm not using any other instruments than the scissors and the bipolar that I've already started with so no extra cost there 
So no more Slater, no SS report. Dr. Mershon, do you usually just do two strips or? Well, it depends again on the size of the fiber, the, the size of the vagina. You know, the most I've had to do is five, you know, relatively larger strips for a bigger uterus. But yeah, I usually just try to get it into one long specimen if I can. You know, essentially butterfly it. Okay, and then I'm going to work back up top. I'm going to let that gas glass clear a little bit. Mike, and then we're going to come back up top again. See if we can get back up this way. Do, do, do. Okay, so here's the fundus again. So we're, we're, we're aiming down towards here. So I'm just going to take a break and uh, try to line this up a little bit. So Mike, there's no way you can uh, put a little more traction on that lateral? That's good. That's good. That's plenty. Yeah. No, that's okay. So again, just a little bit of traction that he does is very helpful. And then again, the key is you got to have traction, counter traction. So if you can't accomplish this with the V care, then obviously it's important enough that you just put a a five millimeter port or something in. But again, I would say most times you're able to do it just with this, the ports that you have. And again, you take this down to the level of the internal cervical os. With the uh, you know essential 3D vision, the the fact that I have two eyes on this thing, my my visualization is probably a lot better than yours. But so again, I'm just using the back end of the scissors to push the tissue one way. And then come up it this way. So again, we've got the whole anterior essentially butterfly. This is the inside of this inside. You can see the V care, and then this is posteriorly here. Okay, so we're going to keep working down posteriorly. So the V-Care is very nice because, again, it gives you not only as a guide, but it gives you that counter-traction that you're looking for to make this thing work. And again, the, the difficult part or the hard part is just, you know, getting into the proper orientation, staying in that orientation. And then especially when you're getting down towards the back end or the back wall, you want to make sure you don't go through it onto the bow. So essentially the whole anterior is butterflied, so now I'm just going to try to get the posterior butterfly, but you can see as you butterfly it, it just drops out laterally. I guess there's a little more I could do anterior. Can you drop that down for a second? Yeah, that's great. So yeah, there's just a little more here. Can you push in, Mike? So again, there's our cup here. So we're going to go straight down towards our cup. Okay, so again, that's all the way down to the cervix there, and that sort of is laying nicely. Okay, and then let's see, can you go straight up now, Mike? Great, perfect, just like that. So this is the bulkiest part here, so we'll see if we can get through that. So sometimes if you're, you know, if you can't, truly bivalve it, you can just get it into manageable pieces. I would still leave them all attached though. Sort of you make it like dreadlocks where it's just uh, multiple fragments or pieces hanging off of the main body. 
and then from the vagina you can work one out at a time as you go below and again with the side docking it just allows you to not have to undock and redock and again in this particular case I'm going to just put some traction on it with the body of the scissors could you do this technique if you're docking the regular way? Uh, you can, you definitely can. It's just that if you need to, you know, manage a bigger specimen, it's a little harder to get between the legs to pull it out. So it, it again, you could do this with straight in docking. It's just when it's time to take the specimen out, you just have to have somebody small enough to get in there. So yeah, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter which way you, you dock or don't dock. Okay, so I think we're pretty much clear posteriorly here. So anyway, so you get your orientation back. And again, we'll look here. So this is the after effect. So here's the endometrial cavity. Here's the fibroid posterior wall. Um, we could probably take this a little bit more posteriorly if need be. Let me just see how we're doing. Actually, that's probably pretty good. I'm just going to amputate this little bit here. So now in this particular case, now we're going across this way. So we're going to let gravity do the work for us. And again, just the weight of the scissors. If I can get the scissors where I want them. Ugh. You can see the uterine laterally. Okay, so that's great. So that is essentially how it will be. I just want to see how big this one is. Okay, so in this particular case, I'm probably going to bivalve this fibroid too, just to give us a little bit of. Uh, extra ability to, to decompress this. So I'm just going to go right through this one. And again, it's just to debulk it so it's not so round when it's coming out. I think he, he could probably get this out now, but why torture him? Right, Ken, you want it easy, right? Okay, so um, at this juncture, then once we once we feel feel like we have it enough, then what we'll do is um, we'll switch back to the regular mode. Uh, one second, I just want to zip through this a little bit, just to try to again decrease the size as much as possible. Still seems pretty bulky here, so. Do, 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 do. Okay. All right, so I think that's essentially trivalved now, and that should be able to come out.
I would imagine, just you sort of, you know, you do the best you can iron it up, seeing what you got. Okay, so can I have the uh, back onto the regular mode? So we can see we got one specimen here. This is the next bigger body, and the other bigger body's over here. Cup in straight, please. And then we'll complete the copotomy like in the regular hysterectomy. So at this point, the three strips are still joined together? Yeah, they're all still, still attached to the cervix. So, brother, we losing gas from where? Okay. Can you uh, close up the vagina with your other hand? So I just need you to push that in a little bit. That's it, great. Okay, cool. And then we're just going to make this incision and complete the copotomy. Okay, let me come around this way. So the reason you want to do the posterior copotomy if you can, even though you're sacrificing a little bit of gas, is because once you have this as a floppy specimen, it just becomes more difficult to get up and around the corners. You can see this is the junction of the vagina and the cervix. I'm just trying to go where we were before. Where was our copotomy? Okay, there it was. Okay, stay put for a second. I just got to get around this side, brother. Other way, other side, Mike. Mike, I'm on the I'm on the left uterine. So you can see this specimen obviously is a little harder to manage for the copotomy, but hopefully a lot easier to manage getting it out of this patient. but there isn't much left that's attached. So we just have to come around this uterine. And again, if you need to, you can always put an accessory port in, but great, Mike. Okay, so that copot oh, let me just see. Okay, yep, the copotomy is complete. So I'm going to actually have him take down the balloon because we don't want to pull it out with the cervix first because that'll just refold it back up like an umbrella. So what we're going to do is give him the fundus. Okay, great. All right down a little, open, close, got it, all right, pull it in, get some of it in the vagina as best you can, so here's her cervix, you can see we didn't sacrifice any vagina, which is nice, so what he'll do is he'll slowly peel each piece and just tell me if you're going anterior or posterior, brother, and I'll feed it. 
I think anterior is probably your best bet initially. Uh -huh. See, so what you can do is if, again, if you don't have a an assistant that can do that, you can then go below now and just work it out. So, brother, you remember how we do with towel clips, interior, you got your vaginal retractor and everything? Just, can you go anterior more? Keep trying to get that part in first. Can you describe what the assistant is doing? So yeah, so right now the assistant is trying to pull it in sort of layer by layer. And then what I'm trying to do is just help guide it around the opening to the vagina. So you, you, you're not trying to pull the whole thing out at once. You're trying to get more and more into the vagina and going. There you go. Good. How you doing, Kenny? Towel clips work the best. So this is uh, again the other half of it. So he's slowly working each piece into the vagina and you get each section. So now this is the final big section. So this is the largest part of it. So if that doesn't go, we can always, you know, do something to make that happen. But I think he'll get it. I've got nothing but confidence in the kid. Yeah, what he's got is just a you know vaginal retractor and usually just um, towel clips or single tooth tenaculum or something along those lines. Keep going, Ken. Don't worry about me. So if you hit a stumbling block, you can always, again, debulk it. Again, if he keeps working anterior, I think he'll get it because it just about wants to come. Mike, you're pushing the button for the smoker now. Okay. You're helping Ken? Okay. There you go. It's just about, it's just about out. There you go. You get it around that corner anteriorly. You got it, brother. There you go. That's a good bite. So, everybody, so when you cut it up, you're trying to cut it up to specimen size that you can physically get out through the vagina. So, again, a lot of it depends on the size of the vagina. Depends on the ability to rem remove it, but he'll be able to get that out. And then if you could leave that in the vagina, that'd be great. Great. Perfect. That's awesome. Perfect. That's perfect, yeah. So essentially the specimen is now in the vagina and then he's going to swap this out. We'll close the cuff. And again, it's just like a regular hysterectomy, but you know, with a 14 to 16 week size, bulky fibroid uterus posteriorly, especially but again, because you have the robot, you can get around corners, you can get that dissection done. And then it's just a matter of uh, getting these angles there. Okay.
So again, I do run the cuff just like I normally would. Nothing changes with the uh, standard way that I do things. The only difference is obviously with the larger cuff opening, then sometimes you just have to use a longer stitch. But my wonderful assistant, Mike, has prepared that properly. Actually, yeah, you know, I gotta cut that. What's that, buddy? That's right. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna put a, just another ang an angle stitch on the other side, and then run the middle. Yeah. So I, I'll need a new stitch. Again, you can see the uterus sacral so nicely with the robot. It's very nice if you can attach that for her. What the heck is going on there? Dr. Michonne, what kind of suture is this again? Uh, this is just a zero Vicro and a CT2 needle. And the needle doesn't have to be bent or changed or anything different. Actually, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna run it from this side. I'll show you a little different way. Um, it's actually easier if you run it from this way because you can actually hold the vagina up for yourself and take good bites. I just always close it from right to left for some reason. But if you want to run the cuff, you can do it this way, and it'll work just as nicely. How can you tell what's a good size bite? Well, you know, again, it's just a matter of uh, being used to it. But I think as, as large as you can get without getting a bladder. So, you know, again, you can, you can really see these inner edges and, again, push the tissue back and take a good bite, you know, uh, it's kind of more subjective than anything else. I mean, you could say, all right, well, you got to at least go half a needle's width or something of that nature, but I sort of just uh, go by feel. And again, push the bladder down with it. You can take it in two bites if you need to. Again, the, the nice thing with the robot is you have the luxury to, to do any suturing that you normally would do open, you can do robotically and probably even better.
So again, you want to try to get in there and get the good mucosa. You know, I think I'm going to tie this one, my friends, and then uh, if you can, give me one more needle. It doesn't have to be as long. You got it. Thank you. Keep coming. Dude, direct it towards the pelvis. There you go. Great, thanks. I think he, he could probably get this out now, but why torture him? Right, Ken? You want it easy, right? So we got about 10 minutes, anesthesia folks. Would I like to what? Yeah, please.
think he, he could probably get this out now, but why torture him? Right, Ken? You want it easy, right? And then, Ken, so I'm just going to ask you to do a suction irrigation one more time, and then... Uh, And then we'll take the inner seat. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, usually with these cases, because you're yorking on the bladder so much they get pretty red and then Ken when you're done could you spray a little bit into the anterior cul-de-sac of clean water just to leave up there thanks